Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm Paul Pribenow, the president here at Augsburg, and I'm happy to welcome you to the 2015, fall 2015, Martin Olaf Sable Symposium, Economics and the Environment. We are uh, certainly uh, ready for a treat tonight with our distinguished panelists uh, in their conversation about the Pope's recent encyclical. Before I say a quick word about that, though, I do want to do a, a public service announcement for another event. We sort of have a crowd here, I think, that might be interested. Tomorrow evening, in this very uh, complex, just down the hall in the Saturn Auditorium at 7 p.m., uh, the young women from the Sisterhood Boutique across the street, which is a um, uh, thrift shop, um, will be doing a fashion show uh, that it will feature fashion, poetry, and food. You can't beat that. Um, 7 p.m. And one of the things about the Sisterhood, these are uh, primarily uh, Somali-American young women, uh, high school women, who um, have been involved in actually creating a business plan with some of our students. So it's really a perfect example of some of our community engagement work, but specifically around social entrepreneurship. And we're very proud of uh, the young women, and we hope they all come to Augsburg College. Um, and we're giving them scholarships to do that, so I think there's some chance they will. Uh, but it's really a wonderful shop, and this will be a great way to celebrate some of that important work uh, here in Cedar Riverside. It seems to me that uh, tonight's topic is uh, so, um, so full of portent if, in many ways, so full of promise. Uh, just, uh, just in my own experience over the past several weeks, um, about three weeks ago, we signed a subscription agreement to put a very large solar array, a solar farm, on top of our ice rinks over here, which we're going to do over the next several months. Um, yes, very cool. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> About two weeks ago, we did an entire series in our chapel here around the whole uh, notion of creation care, and we had a special conversation about how we're going to create an urban arboretum here at Augsburg over the next uh, uh, probably decades uh, it would take to create that urban arboretum and why that was important here in the midst of the city. I've just spent the last couple of days as part of Minneapolis 2015, which we helped to co-sponsor, which was a very high-level conversation about climate change and in particular uh, preparation for uh, the road to Paris, to where we go to Paris here, uh, or many of our fellow citizens go to Paris in just a few weeks here for those high-level climate conversations among 196 nations. And so uh, we all know just how uh, important this is, and we all have this sense of hope that this will be the moment when these various factions come together to actually uh, uh, find common ground and find ways to respond to what we know is happening in our uh, Mother Earth. Uh, on the other hand, we've been in places like this before, and so we also perhaps are full of uh, doubt about whether we can do that. But it certainly helps when the Pope uh, himself stands up and says this is important. Uh, it helps when uh, the Cardinals uh, announce their continued concern for this issue, and tonight we have a chance to hear from two um, very distinguished folks about uh, ways in which that encyclical is helping to shape uh, conversation, helping to shape policy, helping to shape practice uh, around the globe. And so um, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Mr. Tom Berg, who many of you know, who is a distinguished fellow in our Sable Center, and he will introduce our speakers and facilitate the conversation tonight. So great to have you with us. Thank you uh, very much, Paul. And uh, we have developed, I think, a history of some pretty interesting and lively topics and discussions over here at Augsburg in the uh, Sabo Center for Democracy and Learning, and tonight is certainly one. i uh, start out with a quote from Pope Francis, his encyclical, and the, one of the first few paragraphs of the quote, it says, in this encyclical, I would like to enter into a dialogue with all people about our common home. And tonight, we're going to do our part in this corner of the common home to have a dialogue. And we have two excellent speakers here this evening to tell us a little bit more about the encyclical and their thoughts about it and then respond to each other. And between you and I, I'm hoping they really disagree about some stuff up here. So we, we will encourage the disagreement and good humor is always, a, is always a plus in these kind of events. Um, then we'll have questions and answers and comments from the audience. And our standard practice here is that the students go first with uh, questions. And after we have some of their questions, we'll get into some of the rest of us older folks uh, around. But we'll start out with questions from the students. There are some uh, people here, the Sabo scholars at Augsburg, have a microphone or two, and they'll be circulating around for, for questions. That's the, that's the ground rules. Um, 
but let me just make a couple of quick comments about the encyclical itself for those few of you who haven't had time yet to read it and in the process that it is six chapters long and I wouldn't have read it but for tonight and I'm awful glad I did it is six chapters long with 112 end notes it is very readable it's a scholarly but in clear language and uh, a very interesting piece of work about planet Earth, the climate, and all sorts of other topics related thereto that our speakers will talk about in more detail. I came across a quote, though, that I want to mention to you that came from the Franciscan Action Network. And their quote about the encyclical was as follows. If you're reading it, you're going to feel uncomfortable. St. Francis of Assisi taught us that you are never transformed in your comfort zone. So all of us will have to sort of step out of our comfort zone a little bit because there may be some inconvenient truths or otherwise that may come out of the discussion tonight and uh, deal with some of the topics. The, uh, the one quote to show you about the clear language and something that the Pope talked about the Indian encyclical, he said, the earth, our home, is beginning to look more and more like an immense pile of filth. To show you some pretty simple language and possibly get us all out of our comfort zone a bit. Uh, since the dialogue tonight is named after a politician, uh, Martin Sabo, who is over here, former speaker of the House in the Minnesota legislature, 28-year members of Congress and former chairman of the Budget Committee. I'm going to, my last quote from the encyclical would try to put the congressman at ease a little bit here. And uh, it, uh, Pope Francis says, the church does not presume to settle scientific questions or to replace politics. So with that, let me introduce the speakers, and I'll introduce uh, both of them at the beginning, and then... Uh, then we'll just go right into the program. First, uh, on my left right here is Bishop Mark Hansen, Hansen, a leader of uh, global Lutheranism in the 21st century. He has degrees here from Augsburg, from Union Seminary, from uh, Luther Seminary, Seminary. He has been in the Harvard Divinity School. He's been a parish pastor. He was president of the Lutheran World Federation and was the... Um, Bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America from 2001 to 2013. And everybody at Augsburg is quite excited about what's happening on January 1st of 2016 when he becomes the executive director of Augsburg's Christensen Center on Vocation. And a little known fact about Bishop Hansen is that at a Lutheran conference several years back with 25, 30,000 young Lutheran students there, he arrived at the podium, not by walking up from there to here, but he drove in in a motorized bathtub. <laughs> and the motorized bathtub, as I've been told, didn't have any brakes, and we won't go further with that story, but you get the idea that I think he's a uh, a gentleman who has some fun and uh, life about him that can make this thing quite interesting. Now, uh, Professor Francis Holman, Holmans has a degree from Panoma College, a BA in religion, and then uh, shifted gears somewhere in the process here, has a degree for a PhD from the University of California, Davis, a PhD in agricultural economics. She is an award-winning teacher and scholar she is head of the Division of Applied Economics and Agricultural Education at the University of Minnesota. And a little known fact about Professor Holmans is that she comes from a very long line of family members that are very active in international agricultural development and economic work. She was born in Korea, other relatives very involved in India, and so has a real international background about some of these things that fits in very nicely with this worldwide encyclical. So with that, let's give a, a round of warm of applause to both speakers and... Uh...
Thank you, Mr. Berg, and it's good to be with you. Uh, he didn't include that I own also finished Augsburg and four of our six kids, and one of our daughters is uh, adjunct professor of math, so Augsburg has us in our life, and they have us in our will, so they'll have us eternally, so that's, uh, that's a good thing. So it's a great honor to be at the Sabo Forum. Martin and Sylvia Sabo remain two of my heroes in what it means to live the Christian life and vocation serving the common good. Thank you for your continued encouragement. When Gary Hesser asked me to do this, I said, you got to be kidding me. I'm not an economist. I'm not an environmental scientist. I'm not a trained ethicist. And he said, that doesn't matter. Francis has got that covered. So, um, <laughs> so here we go. Um, I, I, this will be like skipping stones to get us started, and then we'll see where the conversation wants to go. Uh, being a preacher, I need to start with a biblical text that came to mind as I read this encyclical through a couple times, and it's from the sixth chapter of Micah. Now, many of us who are Christians at least know the sixth chapter, eighth verse, what does God require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Three characteristics that permeate Pope Francis's uh, papacy and this encyclical. What we too often forget is the context of that sixth chapter. It's a courtroom scene, and Micah is the prosecuting attorney, and God is the plaintiff, and Micah is bringing charges against God's chosen people. And the charge is they have fail to remember their narrative, their history, God's activity in their life, and the purpose God has given them. Now, the interesting question is, so who shall be the jury? You didn't know you are coming for a sermon, did you? Well, here it goes. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow? bow oh, no, let's see. We got the wrong. No, we're good here. Uh, thank you, dear. Uh, I'm going to find the thing, Micah 6, 8. I'm going to get it right here. It goes back to the beginning. Hear what the Lord says. Ride, rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and God will contend with Israel. In other words, the creation is the jury. So I thought of that as a framing for this encyclical. In many respects, Pope Francis is Micah. God is the plaintiff. And Pope Francis is bringing the charge against all of us that we have lost the narrative of our vocation as part of God's creation. And now the jury will be the creation itself to determine whether we shall be acquitted, whether we shall be given probation, or whether we shall be defined as guilty. So that's one way to frame it. A second way is in the hermeneutics of Pope Francis. Not a word we throw around a lot unless you're a biblical scholar. You remember in Greek mythology the god Hermes? Just say you do remember it. I know you're Lutherans, but come on, it's late at night, thank you. And Hermes was the patron of those who crossed boundaries. He was the patron god of shepherds and cowherds, of thieves and road travelers, of orators and poets, yes, of the cunning of thieves and liars. So hermeneutics came to be understood as the framing of how we move from text, in this case sacred text, to the context of our lives. Well, when you read the life of Pope Francis, and by the way, here's a plug for a book if you're at all interested in the person, by all means read The Great Reformer, Francis and the Making of a Radical Pope by Austin Ivory, and he talks about from way back at the beginning of Pope Francis's ministry, then as Father Bergoglio in Argentina, his whole life has been defined by the hermeneutic of Got to get the Spanish, lost it in the language. Well, it's the hermeneutic of the poor, a hermeneutic of the people. In other words, he critiques any economic theory, any political ideology, any theology 
that doesn't first begin by positioning oneself physically in solidarity with those who live in poverty. That was his big critique of liberation theology for which he took a lot of heat after he was elected pope. But it was because he saw liberation theologians leading with a Marxist economic ideology rather than positioning themselves in solidarity with the poor. So for Pope Francis, we don't look to Wall Street and our apps on our phone that give us the economic indicators from Wall Street during the day to see the condition of the economy. We look to the condition of those who live in poverty. And now he would say we look to the condition of the very environment. And there we see reflected the quality of the life of God's people. I had a quote from... Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, but I won't do it because I'm very mindful that I've been asked to perform a miracle in front of you tonight and that speak for only 15 minutes. So that's... Uh, but Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I, I was going to try to weave in some Lutherans here, but Dietrich Bonhoeffer very much has that same sense that we are called to view life from the perspective of below, the maltreated, the outcast, the powerless, the oppressed, and for... Pope Francis in the encyclical, that includes the creation and the creatures that live on the margins as the oppressed and the marginalized. So I want to give you quickly about five consequences of this hermeneutic for Pope Francis, and then I'm going to leave you with six kind of questions and insights and wonderings that I have about it. Am I doing okay? I got... Oh, yeah, well... You may not say that in 12 minutes, but here we go. So rather than quoting these points, I'm going to just name them and we can go back because I did have quotes, but that's going to take too long. So the consequence of this hermeneutic of seeing life through the eyes of those who live in poverty, including the creation that is now in risk of its own viability. Pope Francis says, first... We need to rethink and challenge the dominant technocratic paradigm that tends to frame all of life. And I'm just going to leave that out there because it's you got a lot of quotes from it. Second, when you begin to challenge the dominant techno, technological paradigm that seems to frame life, we will then also have to challenge and rethink notions of power. To quote from Pope Francis, contemporary man has not been taught to use power well because our immense technological development has not been accompanied by a development in human responsibility and values and conscience towards the poor and towards the creation. Now back up to that first point, he doesn't just diss all of technology and science. He acknowledges the wonders of what we have accomplished through technological development and through science. But ultimately the paradigm fall, falls and falters because of the failure to address issues of poverty and the destruction of the environment. So he challenges us to rethink power. And in my life and ministry, I've come to realize power in and of itself is neutral. The question is, how do you use power? So I've been drawn to community organizing as learning the arts of organizing people with the power we have for the sake of the common good. And in this case, for the sake of the common good begins with those in poverty and begins with the well-being of the creation. So then you go from this progression that I see developing through the encyclical from questioning the dominant technological paradigm to leading you to rethink how we understand and use power to then redefine the notion of progress. You see how all of this flows, right? Thank you, dear. Whew. Which leads us then to what is not quite as overt, but being at Augsburg and the Christensen Center, I see it there, leads us to reclaim our understanding of vocation, God's call, God's purpose for our life, as involving all of creation and beginning to think that all of creation has a vocation, not just creatures. 
And how do we begin to discern the shared calling of all of creation and its contribution to our, our communal life? And I confess we don't usually link, but it will be forthcoming in the Christensen Center, President. Uh, we'll be talking about creatures and their vocation. Which leads, at least for me as a Lutheran Christian, to this notion of the grace of God. As Joe Sittler, who I think is one we need to reclaim here, if you haven't read Evocations of Grace, Sittler's writings on the environment, please do so. But he says, is it not possible that we learn to regard the world as a place of grace, to celebrate it in such language that the transcendent grace of God resonates and is reflected in the common grace of creation? And now, Joe Sittler earlier, now Pope Francis in the encyclical, calls us to conversion. Some of us are not so sure about conversion in our theology, but we love it when it comes to the economics and the environment, that we are being called to return the direction of our life. And here's what Joe Sittler said. What we need is a change in the spirit of our minds by putting the grace of God behind the eyes with which we look at the world and into the hands with which we touch the world. And lastly, in that section, I think this calls us to rethink and revisit what Martin Luther wrote about God in all of creation, Christ present in all of creation, and how God, how Luther talks about neighbor and neighbor love needs to now include the creation and the creatures of creation as neighbor we are called to love and serve. Okay. Finally, in that section, I think all of this calls us to communal lament as our starting point. There is great power when we engage in public communal lament, crying out to God for mercy. Even, said Paul in the 8th chapter of Romans, the creation groans in travail. The creation laments under the weight of our consumption. And Walter Brueggemann said, lament is the first step followed by relinquishment. What do we need to lay down? What do we no longer need to do and, and own and how we live in order that, Brueggemann says, God's mercies may, may be made new in the morning. Okay, here's my uh, quick, what do I got, four minutes, three minutes? Four minutes and my six concluding points. Here's where I kind of go, kind of more Mark's reflections. First of all, I think the encyclical as a whole is a wonderful window into the papacy of Francis and how he approaches leadership because he's drawing collaboratively on the bishops' conferences all over the world. If you know Roman Catholic politics, you know a big question is what's the authority of bishops' conferences? And he gives them great authority. And he quotes from previous popes. And he quotes from the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew, an ecumenical source. And he quotes from scientists. And he quotes from history. This is a pope that isn't going to exercise authority singularly as a move of power, but the authority to convene and bring wisdom to the table. What an encouraging sign. I need to say, I'm co-chairing a Lutheran Catholic dialogue piece in the United States. I think we Lutherans could live with acknowledging that kind of papal authority as primacy in the church. But that's another topic, and don't tweet it out, please. OK, some questions. Can we really address issues of the environment and the future of the environment and not give attention to the complex, controversial questions of population? He avoids it virtually in total, understood as a Catholic theologian. I know also from traveling around the world that the questions of population control seem to be questions exercised by the privileged and the dominant. So we need to be attentive to its not only Catholic dynamics, but its cultural economic power dynamics. But we need to at least put it on the table. Secondly, I wonder if traditional moral, Roman Catholic moral teaching is adequate and he doesn't spend much time with it. But what I know of traditional Catholic moral teaching is 
It tends to be a natural law ethic. The orders of creation are given in creation and it tends to be heavily based upon the principle of subsidiarity. I sat with Representative Ryan, you'll appreciate this, shoulder to shoulder with two other Catholic leaders in the middle of one of those budget debates and we were there to challenge him on his proposals to reduce the social network that saves people in poverty because he wanted to cut some of that and he was arguing on the basis of the principle of subsidiarity from Catholic moral teaching. And we know that much of natural law has led to an ordering hierarchically of relationships, men and women, and relationships of domination to the creation. I think we need to rethink what's the middle axiom ethically that we come at these questions from. And I think the ELCA social statement on human sexuality, you knew I'd get that in there, was right when we chose the middle axiom of an ethic of responsibility coming from Bonhoeffer as the framing ethic for how we talk about these complex issues and a way forward. Uh, fourth, we need to talk much more about evil and structural evil. I commend to you Cynthia Mo Labeda's book. I'm in the middle of it. I encourage you all to read it, Resisting Structural Evil, Love as Ecological and Economic Vocation. Nobody wrote that down, but you can come up afterwards and get it from me. Uh, whatever number I'm on, because I've got one minute. This is a great opportunity for interfaith relationships to move from dialogue to diapraxis, where we come together out of our diversely held religious traditions, rituals, and practices, not asking us to set those aside, but from them come to our common creation and common humanity and share a common ethic. I was at the Parliament for World Religions last week, 9,500 people from as broad a religious spectrum as you can imagine. Angels float in, literally, with wings and lights. And from New Zealand, New Age angels. I mean, it was a whole spirituality thing. But what was one of the unifying themes is the common humanity and common creation that we are called to share responsibly. Last night I was at St. Thomas, a dialogue between Christians and Muslims and this great Islamic declaration on global climate change that preceded the papal encyclical but needs to have as much attention and engagement uh, as does the encyclical. I was one of the recipients of the Common Word document written by Islamic leaders all over the world after 9-11 and the attention that got as a source of dialogue, I think now is the time for a common word on economics and the environment with contributions from a host of religious leaders. Finally, I think the Pope calls us not just to focus on all that is wrong and our failures, but call us to rejoice praising and thanking God for the awe and the wonder and the beauty of this most mysterious, intricate creation of which we are such a part. Thanks. Well, this will be a bit of a change of pace, I would say. <laughs> I want to say it's all about Prices. So I'm an economist. Prices is where it's at. Um, I'll start to, uh, by saying that uh, I think the encyclical is a call to people to recognize the importance and beauty of our global common. So he called it our common home. We in economics talk about common property and the global commons. Um, and a commons is something that it can be enjoyed by everyone, but that can be degraded by the actions of individuals. The word commons came from thinking about commons where you, you take your sheep and you graze them on the, global, on the commons. The more you sheep you put on there, the worse uh, that common area becomes. So it, 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 if it's accessible to everyone, but that the actions of individuals can degrade it, then you have a situation, uh, the situation of a commons, and we have the global commons. And examples of global commons would include our atmosphere, 
our rich biodiversity, our open oceans, our Arctic and Antarctic regions, and as I was looking this up, also outer space is a, is a global commons. Uh, I guess there is space junk up there. It's not one of my, not one of the things that keeps me up and worried at night. Uh, so Pope Francis asks us to appreciate the importance of these things that benefit us all. So I think uh, that's something that economists can understand. Economists, since Adam Smith, have understood the power and value of markets. Uh, through self-interest and willing exchange, people improve their well-being. We have this fundamental appreciation for markets. Bakers bake bread, wanting to make a profit. Consumers buy bread, wanting to eat. They mutually exchange, and both are better off because of that exchange. And nobody has to be in the middle saying, okay, you make this, you make this, you eat this, you eat this. It just happens because of markets and the willing exchange uh, between parties. However, that idealized world of Adam Smith ignores several major shortcomings of a realistic market economy. The first is the presence of market failures. And what we mean by that is that just the market functioning freely uh, can not lead to the best outcome for everyone. If there are things like uh, unregulated pollution, or monopoly, those market distortions cause the outcomes not to be the best for everyone. The second is inequality of opportunity and income is another source of market failure. Um, so let's, let's talk about market failure, specifically the idea of an externality. So an externality is the cost of some activity, either production or consumption, that is not fully borne, where the cost is not fully borne by the person who who creates the cost. This can be something as simple as playing loud music in your dormitory or, uh, or smoking a cigarette, throwing the butt on the floor, which I really, really, really disapprove of. It makes me crazy. Um, so uh, those are externalities. You, you impose this cost of the cigarette smoke on others. They, they bear the cost. You don't. And that, that is a problem. More profound externalities would be things that degrade that, that, that global commons I was talking about. Uh, driving a car, we all do that. Maybe we don't all do that. I make an, made an assumption there. Um, or running a coal-fired power plant to generate electricity. These activities generate costs that are not necessarily fully borne by the people who, who engage in that activity. So... Um, the, the, the central issue that economists would recognize with externalities is that the price is just too low, that the costs are not fully borne by the person generating that, that cost. So what we need to do is, is impose that cost in addition to the private cost you bear. You need to also bear the social cost. And this is exactly the language of the encyclical, actually. <laughs> So there's considerable agreement. I think there were some economists in the room, possibly, in addition, in addition to the bishops and, and uh, philosophers. Um, but if you look at paragraph 195, I know you've been reading it, but um, the principle of the maximization of profits, frequently isolated from other considerations, reflects a misunderstanding of the very concept of the economy. As long as production is increased, Little concern is given to whether it is at the cost of future resources or the health of the environment. As long as the clearing of the forest increases production, no one calculates the losses in, entailed in the desertification of the land, the harm done to biodiversity, or the increased pollution. In a word, businesses profit by calculating and paying only a fraction of the costs involved. I would heartily agree with that, and economists would tend to agree with that. If you don't bear the full cost, that is a problem. Um, so we need to internalize those costs, uh, not necessarily forbid, <laughs> rule out, uh, eliminate the activity, but have that activity bear the full cost. So one obvious answer is to impose some type of tax or fee on the externality. Now it's really complicated to figure out what's the best amount to charge. Or what is the appropriate fee? Does it increase at an increasing rate? What is the optimal? I mean, there's a range of e economic questions. But in principle, you can imagine that it's right to increase that cost so that it reflects the total cost, not just the private cost. So um, 
The encyclical points out the need to replace fossil fuels with renewable energy and conservation. It also acknowledges that this will be expensive. So who will develop the new energy technologies that will replace fossil fuels? And more important, why would people use more expensive fuels when cheap fossil fuels are available? Well, the answer is prices. Say it with me. Okay, so if you're able to make taxes on carbon high enough, well, you solve a bunch of problems. The alternative energy sources, such as solar and wind, would become relatively cheaper than the fossil fuels if you make the cost of fossil fuels high enough, higher than solar and wind, well, you're going to leave that coal, those fossil fuels in the ground. You're going to strand that, and that's what we need, right? We, we want to avoid depleting our carbon, bu carbon budget if we want to reach that, keep our global warming to less than 2%, we're going to leave some of that coal in the ground. We have to do that. So, so tax that coal so it's more expensive than solar and wind, and you're going to come a long way to that. In addition, the revenues that you can get by charging those taxes can fund things like technological development, right? Is technological development a bad thing? Mark Hansen? No. Um, <laughs> So, well, so the Pope would say maybe some technology is good, some technology is bad, but certainly technologies that improve the efficiency, the, 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 the efficiency of solar and wind technologies, just talk about putting up solar panels, that technology is way better than it was 20 years ago. Uh, the technology of energy storage. Well, the sun only shines, right, half of the time. In Minnesota right now, it's less than half the time. Wind only blows so much of the time. So you need technology to capture that, uh, that energy so that you can use it when you need it. Well, the, the, the development of those technologies may be um, spurred by the profit motive. People following their own self-interest to make money so that they can sell something. There's technological development there. But funding for basic science that is a public good that anybody can access, that is most properly funded by uh, big governments, or governments with money, that they might be able to get the money from the tax revenues to fund that basic research so that you can spur that technological development to make wind and solar even cheaper than those fossil fuels. There's another idea. To organize markets, to better recognize the value of our natural resources. Um, this is the idea of the Natural Capital Project, and let me put a plug in for my colleague Steve Pulaski, who in concert with ecologists at Stanford, is working on just that. What are the values of the natural environment from, from um, uh, flood control benefits to water quality improvements, all these services that nature provides? What are the values of those things so we can recognize those values, not just the negative externality costs, but those positive uh, natural capital values so that we can recognize those and not just ignore them. Partha Dasgupta, who's an economist, would want to include those values in our national income accounting. So that it's not just enough to see GDP go up if you're degrading your natural capital. That's not good, right? If we included those values of the natural capital into those national income accounts, it wouldn't look so good if you're able to grow your deep GDP by cutting out down all your forests and, and degrading your natural environment. So there are really some positive examples from the idea of natural capital. One of the ones that I like to think about is in New York City, they were considering water treatment as, an, as a necessary, uh, building a water treatment plant would be necessary if development occurred in the Catskills. So the Nature Conservancy, the Municipal Water in New York City, various groups got together and preserved a bunch of land in the Catskills from development. It was a lot cheaper than building a water treatment plant. There was preserved land. Um, and so not, I mean, it worked even without the, the wonderful benefits of being able to hike in the Catskills. It worked because it made economic sense that the value of the, of the land for water filtration uh, was um, justified keeping it preserved for that purpose instead of building an expensive water treatment plant. Bottom line of all of this, it's all about, what did, what did I say before? It's all about prices. It's all about prices and attributing the, the right prices to the valuable things that we care about. It's putting the negative 
you know, the costs, making people bear the costs of the things that we don't like, getting those prices right is uh, very important. And I think the Pope and the encyclical, in principle, would agree with all of that. Um, so, um, the, 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 just the idea that market failures are significant and need to be corrected. We need to incorporate the, the value of the wonderful things and incur the cost of the bad things and not just not pay the cost or not capture that value. Am I 15 minutes in already? <laughs> I have all the things about how we would disagree, so maybe I'll save those for later. <laughs> I'm on a roll? All right. For disagreements, we got that. Okay. All right, so that there's some areas of disagreement. So I'm looking in, the, looking in the press. One of the big ones, and Gary and I talked about it like the, the first time that he was trying to convince me to come do this. I said, well, I was reading a little bit about the encyclical. It looks like the Pope is against cap and trade. Um, and economists have, have uh, you know, we have maybe our issues, but fundamentally think that the idea of cap and trade is a good one. So um, let's see. Uh, Right, so here are, the, here are the bullets without the long quotes, right? So the, the bullets are uh, buying and selling carbon credits, the effect of pricing on the poor, uh, the view about consumerism, uh, suspicion of technology, and population policy. So you already hit on the population policy one. Um, so I think there's some, um, I'm not sure why the Pope doesn't like uh, carbon credits, but there is a very clear statement in paragraph 171 about this. Um, the system seems to provide a quick and easy solution under the guise of certain commitment to the environment, but in no way does it allow for the radical change in which present which the radical change which present circumstances require. Rather, it may simply become a ploy which permits maintaining the excessive consumption of some countries and sectors. Oh, there's some there's some rhetoric there. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure what he means. Uh, I think. Um, economists have interpreted this as, a, as an indictment of cap and trade. And cap and trade is an alternative, sort of equivalent thing to taxing the carbon. It kind of has a different distributional tinge, um, but fundamentally quite equivalent, in which if you pollute, you need to bear those costs. If you, um, and it, it's a way to get that done efficiently. If for some firm it's really expensive to reduce their pollution, and for some other firm it's cheaper, well, that cheaper one can reduce, sell the permits to the more expensive one. And maybe that just seems wrong, <laughs> that you have a right to pollute. Maybe, maybe that's, the, that's the thing we disagree, degree, disagree on. Um, so I don't know, that, that might be a source of some discussion. Um, it, it's, it's a system that has worked in um, reducing lead in, in gasoline. It's worked in reducing SO2, which is the cause of, of acid rain. It's worked in uh, renewable portfolio standards for, for renewable energy. Um, so harnessing those market forces to achieve the goals that we want, we would say, is a pretty good idea. Um, I think the problem has been in the implementation sometimes of these, of these things. And so I think it's getting the institutions and the politics right is really important. So just some, uh, some I heard about this like a week ago in our environmental resource economics sem uh, seminar. There's this example called the clean development mechanism where wealthy countries can pay poor countries to, to sequester carbon. Like don't cut down your forests, we'll pay you not to cut down your forests so that you can keep that, that carbon sequestered. Well, that system was rife with possibilities for fraud, corruption, all kinds of horrible things. Lots of windmills were built in China that are not used. I think, and I don't know the uh, actual <laughs> facts here, but in China there were these companies that would create greenhouse gases to then destroy the greenhouse gases and get the credits for destroying the greenhouse gases. Some sketchy stuff happened, and so this kind of gives the whole idea a bad name, and, and I'm with him, with him on that one. Um, the effect of externality pricing on the poor. Um, we would say that you need an instrument for each problem you're addressing. If, you're in, if you want to address externalities, you should price externalities. If you want to help the poor, you can help the poor. But we don't sort of believe in killing two birds with one stone. You've got to have two stones for two birds. <laughs> um, 
And, and I say, I guess I would echo what Mark said about population policy. If you think about externalities in a sort of a cold e economist way, uh, children are externalities. I have three of them, they're lovely, <laughs> and they really are. <laughs> but they impose a cost, <laughs> and I don't bear that whole cost. Um, so, uh, you know, economists can get into some pretty murky territory there, but I think there is some, when I think about, about families and women and the number of children women want and the number of children men want and the disparity there, I just ha have to think that there's some room for, for power <laughs> used for good to strengthen the, the uh, power of women to be able to control their own, uh, their own fertility. So that's what I think. I don't know if that's what economists would say, but that's what I would say. Um, one of our grad students is, did, has been doing some work in Tanzania, and the number of children women want is like four, and the number of children their partners want is like eight, ten. So, and the women tend to have eight, ten, rather than the four, um, which I think is a problem. Um, so I, I guess I'll wrap up with there's a lot to like about the encyclical, you know, I, our common home, I, I kind of like our common home. Uh, it's a call for action, an appeal for all of us to think about our common home, the, or how we would call it, the global commons. He appeals to us to put values on things that have value. And economists understand this idea, and we have work to do to get those prices right, <laughs> and to make sure those prices are paid uh, and the things that have value are recognized for their value. Okay. and critique of technology in the encyclical. I, he probably understates the value of technology that you have tried to cite because I think he wants to make the critique. And his critique is technology tends to be anthropocentric. It tends to focus on humanity as the center of the development of technology. Secondly, it's based on the lie that there's an infinite supply of the Earth's goods. Uh, and so consequently, with an anthropocentric science and technology, we literally drain the Earth's resources, squeeze them dry. And then he said that leads to a science of technology as the epistemological paradigm which shapes our lives, our education, and our living. And I thought, well, that's a great reason why Augsburg's got a new building which is going to bring science, technology, and religion together. I got it in, Paul. That's great. Um, I... A quick two stories that came to mind for me out of my life experience. One was being in El Salvador during the Bush administration and meeting with the U.S. ambassador, having Bishop Mardardo Gomez with me, and listening to this U.S. ambassador who got that position as a successful supporter of President Bush financially, and arguing that sweatshops were a gift of the U.S. investors to the economy of El Salvador and that the resulting exports of food products from El Salvadorian farms growing what our markets needed rather than how to feed the people of El Salvador was not unjust and had no imperial destructive impact on the environment or the economy. Juxtapose that with being in rural Zimbabwe a year and a half ago and watching predominantly women trying to build sustainable economic development in their rural village that would address economic growth, the care of creation, the well-being of children in terms of health and malaria and disease, and have a cooperative economic tool where they were all investing in this shared bank, taking loans, paying interest, and sharing profits. I thought, uh, leave it to the people. <laughs> to create an economic, ecological system that is just, and we're, we will find more signs of hope. What I'm still left with is I, I don't get the dual pricing piece. I mean, I'm not an economist, but it seems like when you start talking about taxation, it's going to fall on everyone 
including the poor. And I literally don't know, how do we have a more just development of sustainable ways to live in the creation that don't have a perpetuation of the increase of poverty as a byproduct? And you can just help me as an economist. Francis, there you go for a little bit here. Back, go ahead for a short answer. I did say that I thought that if you were going to price the negative thing like carbon, right. that everybody should pay that price. Um, and, and I guess, you know, the two birds with one stone idea, that you're going to then have that cost reflected in the activity. Um, but, right, if you, if you as a society believe in helping, helping the poor, which I think we do, um, you can get those revenues and <laughs> recycle them back to something that you care about. Okay, so there's that double dividend idea where you're, you're, you're taxing the bad thing, and the byproduct of that is that you, what I said in my remarks okay. was you use those revenues to maybe support the technology that makes you know, wind and solar cheaper, or if, if what you do is you're collecting from the poor, uh, you can recycle that back or recycle from, from wealthier. It's yeah. institutions matter, right? Yeah. Questions here. Um, if we have somebody with microphones here somewhere back there, okay. Raise your hand if you have a question. Um, somebody got uh, some. Right, right back uh, there. We got a student uh, here first. They don't have to. Right, it doesn't need to be a question, It'd be a comment that you disagree with our speakers, that they're all wet about something or other, or whatever, uh, jump right in here. Feel free to do so. Um, go ahead, back there. I have a question regarding the economics and economic policy behind cap and trade. Um, I understand that the Earth has a natural capacity to handle a certain level of pollutants going into it. Um, and, has, and always has, but um, the question I have is how would you think that market policy or tax policy should turn the cap and trade idea, which if I understand it correctly, which I may not, um, as a you did pollution, you have to pay money but money isn't what we're after. We're after a way to get rid of pollution. And as we've seen with different ways of raising money, they often go into things like tax reduction or different spending in other areas of uh, the, the budget. So how would you think that market policy, uh, politics, however you want to say it, make sure that the money from cap and trade ideas go into uh, environmental restoration as opposed to just whatever people feel like doing that day. Okay, so, so that's, a, that's an excellent question. I think if you want to use that, so whether you do a cap and trade or tax the carbon, you're going to achieve the goal of reducing the pollution because you're making, in either case, you're making the generator of the pollution pay the cost of it. Um, and I think what you're saying is where does the money go? Well, that's all in the design of the setup. You could do a number of things. One, you could just give people the credits, the permits to pollute. They trade it amongst themselves. The government doesn't reap any of that benefit. It doesn't go to helping the poor or anything, right? It's just you've managed to cap that amount of pollution. You've done it in an efficient way, in an economical way, so that you achieve it at least cost. But none of that, none of the revenue goes to any other purpose. So that's one option, just give the permits away. And that's one of the things that I think makes a cap and trade idea quite uh, palatable, right? You may be able to get through the political process uh, I'm not sure why it didn't manage to get through the, I mean, it, it didn't get through, I think, because it didn't impose a cost and a cap, but you don't also have to pay for the permits. So that's one, just give them away. Two, you could auction off the permits. Oh, you want a permit? You're going to have to pay me for it, right? And then you're able to capture some of the revenue. Or, or third, if you want to 
tax, right, the, then the government gets revenue. Um, but in any of those cases, you're going to reduce the thing that you don't like, the pollution. What you do with the proceeds and something else is, is another question. Does that make sense? <coughs> Sort of. I mean, I was sort of a touting the benefit of like, oh, you could pay it for a bunch of other things, and depending on how you set it up, uh, that the devil is in all kinds of details, and that's that's one of those one of those things. Other um, questions? Uh, I see a hand over here, or one over here. I see. So I have a question for Professor Homans. Um, you talked a lot about cap and trade and uh, carbon taxes, how they'd be effective policy to reduce carbon pollution. Well, a lot of the thought in American government, at least, and with the EPA and the Minnesota State Legislature, is that the most effective way to reduce carbon pollution, especially with our energy, is to is to require energy quotas, right? A clean energy uh, quota, um, and, and it seems to be working very well because you know, they, they, they keep on doing more of it. Uh, what do you think about those, those clean energy standards? Um, yeah, so the, you're talking about the renewable portfolio standards? Yep. Where you need to hit some level of renewable energy, and, and you can actually trade those renewable energy credits. So mm -hmm. they're harnessing kind of that idea of the market where you can generate credits by producing solar in your house, and then you can sell those credits. To, um, and so that's what that's getting at is the goal of getting higher renewable energy in the state. And I think it seems to be working very well in an, in, an efficient, in an efficient way. It seems like if you had a national program of uh, carbon credits or paying for carbon, you wouldn't necessarily need that renewable portfolio standard. But it seems like sometimes states lead the way. I know California mm -hmm. leads the way, Minnesota leads the way. It's like, well, if everybody else isn't doing this, well, at least we'll do it and we'll make some progress and demonstrate that it can be done. And, and so, you know, uh, you don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good, and I think, I think it's a great, uh, great way to get some of this going and, and, and convince people that it's worth doing. You achieve some of those economies of scale, too, right? Just one person has a solar, solar panels, that's one thing, but if a bunch of people do, you're able to, uh, to generate those economies. Um, I have another question for uh, Professor Holmans. Um, we're talking about Mark. You can comment on it uh, if you have something to say after. But, <laughs> Bishop Hansen, I've got one for you in a minute here. Um, we've been talking quite a bit about market. We've only been talking actually about market-based solutions, uh, quotas, and uh, taxes on carbon. But we haven't been asked, we haven't asked the question, well, why do externalities exist to the extent that they do? Um, and that, you know, you could very well reason that they exist because the people that own the companies don't work in the factories or don't live near the oil plant where the, those externalities are inflicted on the people. So my question is, why don't economists prom promote uh, producer cooperatives, localized ones, in which people who work in the factories own the factories and live near the factories. And you can virtually eliminate externalities without regulation because they regulate themselves. So why doesn't the economics discipline acknowledge that? Or? Yeah, or do they? <laughs> the closest I can, I can think of for that, well, um, I have kind of two ideas. One is the whole Nobel Prize winning work of Ronald Coates, who he wouldn't say that government should be involved in externalities at all, that people can negotiate and talk to each other and figure it out. So your example of, a, of workers who are producing the externality potentially and living nearby, really it is internalized in that. If you're producing the thing and then experiencing the externality, it's really internalized. Um, or, uh, or like if I have a neighbor who has loud music at night, <laughs> like, or who chews really loudly, that's the, the, just a side note, I really hate loud chewing. My, my, aunt, my aunt sent me a, a link that said, you know, this could be a sign of genius. So just call me genius because I hate the loud chewing. No, um, 
so uh, what was I going to say? So negotiation, like the loud music and so on, you can negotiate among people if the negotiation costs are not that high. And I think that's what you may be getting at. If you're, if you reduce those, those, um, a b reduce the cost of like working it out with your neighbor, or if you are the neighbor, <laughs> then I think you do get rid of the problem of externalities. It's the global nature of these externalities that's the enormous problem, you know. I emit S, uh, carbon dioxide by driving from here to St. Paul. That emission of carbon dioxide glows into the atmosphere that affects billions of people, right? So it's really hard to imagine kind of working that out. So I think that's when those negotiation costs get that high. Um, I don't know how you can internalize it with kind of the methods that you're talking about. I think it works for kind of more localized externalities. And, and, and frankly, there's this whole, economists have thought about that commons idea, well, you need to tax, you need to price. There's a whole scholarship, Eleanor Ostrom, who started this, who also won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> Name dropping, oh, <laughs> like crazy tonight. But you know, there are rules that develop among people who live close by and maybe, um, you know, you would all agree this, the, your group of, of is it Bob Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're living in community, figuring it out, and benefiting each other. And I think that there's, it's not all, it's not all somebody coming in and saying you have to do it this way, but people working it out. So I think there's room for that. But when you talk about the global climate, I think you got to go something bigger. You got to think a little bigger. Does your question imply? Are you advocating for a little different whole economic system than what we're talking about? No. What. Um what I'm proposing is a producer cooperative, which is, um, I think, some cafes around here actually run that way, in which the workers own, the, they have ownership in the, in the company, and they earn the profits in the company, and they're distributed among all the workers. And so, do you think that that can be replicated on a national scale, and maybe more beyond that, and should be? Yes, and for energy, especially with solar panels as a form of renewable energy, it works very well because everyone's house can become a power plant then. And that house, if they have surplus energy that they don't use, then they can sell it back. So then people can make profits, everyone can make the profits versus just a handful of people running the companies who don't care about what's happening to the families or whatever around the oil plant, because they don't live there. <clears throat> Any comments? Uh, others? All right. Uh, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you. More, we got a bunch of questions over here now. Hi there. Um, I just, my question is kind of aimed at something that Professor Holman said, but I would love if you would both uh, join in. It sounds like you guys have some really global experiences. Um, so you were talking about how uh, the power of the women to control their fertility and children's externalities, that sort of thing. Um, but Pope Francis, when he writes, he briefly touches on population. Um, and he asks if the distribution of available resources is the thing creating obstacles to development and the unequal population distribution in and of itself, not just um, what was called overpopulation. So I was wondering if you guys could kind of comment on the distribution rather than just the overpopulation. <coughs> Maybe you can both comment on that one. <laughs> I mean, I think one of the things about population too is that it tends to grow fastest in places that are poor. So as countries get wealthier, the, you know, <laughs> people have fewer children. And, um, so that sort of, you know, exacerbates the problem. We have communities living on a small resource base, and they're the ones that ha seem to be having lots and lots of children, putting even more pressure on the resource base. Um, and then some economist comes around and wants to tax their use of the resource base, and where are they? Um, so I don't know the solution to that problem. <laughs> I don't have a solution either, and I think it's a very hard conversation to even create coming from the outside and when a community has the norm that 
population choice belongs to each family, how many children, and it comes out of economic necessity, it comes out of deeply held religious tradition, and the consequence then is not only on the economic life of that family unit now growing, but also on the environment. How do we create that conversation that doesn't imply a judgment before the conversation starts, yet we have a culture of enough trust that we can challenge each other's presuppositions? I, I think the hardest conversations to have are where we have a conflict of our deepest held truth claims, and if we don't create a culture in which we can hang in the conversations long enough to create trust so that we can acknowledge those and try to find a solution together, I, I think the disparity will continue and the consequence on the environment will continue. I mean, I've sat in the bush in Africa with uh, men who have more than one wife and they don't understand how we can be a, a church welcoming of gay and lesbian folks and I say I don't understand how you can be living in these relationships and then we begin to talk about the economic realities, the cultural, the religious and we don't find a way to get through those differences and if we don't the consequence is going to be what the Pope calls us to address, the continued destruction of the environment and the disparity of wealth and poverty. So. You raised a really, really tough question that we have to find a way to have the conversation without imposing values at the beginning, but creating solutions because we're going to stay in that conversation together. Excellent question. Um, another one over here. Thank you. I feel like a representative of everyone from this side, so you're safe with me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, two things. First, um, I think we're misunderstanding the word technocracy. Reverend, you brought it up first. and It's not necessarily this idea of technology, but rather this idea of expertism and how that plays out in society and how like, we each have our own expertises and things like that. Um, but second main thing is more of a discussion point, and that is we are so far dealing with a lot of different challenges that we need to solve in some way or another, and the Pope gives us a way that we can go through that, um, and that is citizen politics. And I was wondering if you two could converse and disagree about citizen politics. All right, other... Um, Thanks for the clarification on the first one. The phrase yeah. he uses is technocratic paradigm, right? That was yes. Just more consistent with what you're arguing, so thanks for that. So you want us to talk about Citizen politics. Go for it. <laughs> I've heard of citizen science. Citizen science is super cool. Well, let, let's use the microphone. Let's, I, I'd, I'd be curious. Uh, we're, we're, a bunch of us are political so, <laughs> animals in here and hear about citizen politics. At this point, before I butcher it, I'm going to enlist the help of Harry Boyd. He's over there in the hat. Awesome Scottish looking thing. I'll enlist his help, but I'll first give a brief sort of idea that surrounds citizen politics, and that is that instead of this idea that each person counts as a vote for something and getting like towards our like a vote or something like that, rather this idea of citizen politics is grounded in an idea that we all are co-creators in something and that in order to do something we must come together and create that, whatever that is. A good example that the Reverend might know is the Isaiah Project. Um, or Isaiah, yes, mm -hmm. um, and they are really big in citizen politics and like how do we come together as a community of faith, as people of faith, and engage in change in our world. And I'm really not sure about what's in the economics world. Well, I, I hinted, at it, now that you have framed it, I hadn't heard the phrase as much as you used it, but I think I told you I'm a strong proponent of networks that teach the arts of leadership and organizing so that power, money, and relationships can be organized for a common shared good uh, that I, th I hear you calling citizen politics. I kind of push off against the co-creator image and I like co-creature better and I think co-creature is more consistent with the encyclical. We can debate about that, but I think co-creator can tend to put us in a position um, that doesn't fit for me theologically or ecologically as much as co-creature, but that's a side point. So, no, I'm, uh, when I was a bishop, 
first thing I did was hire community organizers to work with us to organize the power the people of St. Paul had over their lives. And I like the idea of then talking about that as citizen politics. The encyclical, I know, talks, there's uh, some uh, language in there about the importance of NGOs, for example, and uh, local government initiatives, local government uh, laws, and zoning. So it is, while he talks also about a, uh, the need for an improved world order, the local thing he, the, the Pope also mentions quite significantly as being very, very important, which I take it is kind of where you're, part of where you're coming from at least. So um. I, I just have, I have a comment, I'm not sure it's related to that, but it's to undermine my whole uh, talk about how prices are everything and that's a solution to everything. So I thought I would be a, my own detractor for a moment. Um, so, so I was exposed to the work of Michael Sandel, he's a political philosopher at Harvard, and he has this whole thing about prices potentially distorting the good that it is that you're um, purchasing or trading. And the idea of prices undermining uh, civic life and, and uh, examples he gave were things like, okay, you want kids to read more? Let's pay them to read more. Okay, you, uh, and there's an example of a Swiss, uh, there's a Swiss survey where people were asked, you know, uh, appealing to your, um, your sense of civic pride and the good of, of the common good and all that, uh, this location is really the best to put a nu nuclear waste site. Would you be willing to have this in your backyard? And people said yes, generally. If they, those same people were asked, if we paid you $1,000 a year to have a nuclear waste site in your backyard, would you be willing to do that? And they said no. So, um, so, so there are things that we do because we believe in them, because we care about them, because, uh, because we want to live in community, that if we were paid for them, it would change the nature of the good that we're engaged in. Uh, so the reading of the book, well, I'm just reading it because I, I want the money, not because I love reading and it's inspiring and me some joy. Um, so I think you have to watch out for cases in which you're trying to impose a market mechanism on something that really, if you do that, it changes the nature of the good that is being traded. Uh, and that's not so good. I don't believe that about carbon taxes. I think carbon taxes, <laughs> definitely. I don't feel like, I f in fact, I feel like you know, I want to share this cost among everybody. If I'm the one who's, you know, always recycling and doing all the good things and everybody else is not, that kind of gets to you after a while, doesn't it? But if everybody, every time they burn a, ga a gallon of gasoline is paying that external cost, and by paying that external cost, you're overall reducing it, well, that's a shared thing that someone else is helping, me, helping us to enforce that we all participate in, that feels a whole lot better than me being the sucker that's uh, always walking to work and carrying my brown paper bag and, and you know, doing all the composting and doing all those things which are, are valuable, but other people are not doing that because they're like, they don't care about it. Those are some thoughts. So, um, help me understand, other than carbon tax, what what would, when he keeps talking about we need a conversion, for me that's a radical change of direction. So what other than carbon tax would be a change in policy and practice economically that would have the most impact on both the environment and those who live in poverty? Or are you, are you continually saying you can't find mutual benefit from one policy, they have to be always two? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think what other concrete manifestations of this conversion can we implement and activate for besides carbon tax? Well, I don't know. I, I, I'm working on a paper. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the common, so working on this idea of, of uh, common fisheries areas in, um, in poor countries. And so one way to it, you know, and so these things are very depleted. The fish are little tiny things. You're, you're not getting the most benefit out of this resource, but if you close the access, you close the access to people. Well, can you design some kind of institution, right, that, 
this says, okay, you know, let's manage this in a more sustainable way. The fish get to grow. It's, it produces more value for people. And then you somehow take that value and distribute it or create some kind of market or do something. Maybe it's along the lines of your Zimbabwe villagers who are creating something of value out of something that that if you just let people, you know, just harvest, it's just not going to have that value. So it's somehow supporting that activity that generates value and, and then feeds it back into the people who I don't know if that's an answer to your question. But I believe in things like that. Um, okay. Yep, question? Yeah, I'm going to ask a question. Um, so it's, uh, it's, should I stand up? Is that? I, I can't see, well, yeah, okay, up. there we go, yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, so it's nice to be here. Thank you both for speaking. Um, it's interesting, the principles that have uh, supported the policy in this country of regarding economics has all been about growing our economy and economic growth as quickly and as possible and as cheaply as possible, if that makes sense. Um, and it's created so much destruction. And so um, for me, having an economist in front of me, I'd love to ask this question. Um, a, economics to me is based on this one fatal flaw, I would call it, which is that people behave rationally. And people don't behave rationally. And one thing they can actually measure is, is brain activity that fires, um, that tells us if someone is happy, okay? So someone, um, uh, who buys 10 cars, 10 SUV cars that, you know, use all this gasoline and someone who wants to order food from across the nation that's trucked um, and takes a ton more energy to produce than it does to consume, than it gives you in consuming it. So um, at a certain point, money doesn't make you happier, but people still want these extremes of wealth. So how can we... And consumer behavior is really irrational. So how can we use economic policy that's, and when economics is based on this rationality principle to solve this huge crisis? And there's countries, smaller island countries that, that can only do 1.5 degrees Celsius increase in global warming before their country is destroyed and like gone. And we have our, our <clears throat> really developed nation leaders, you know, have decided on two degrees. Um, so I, I guess that's, that's my question for you, if you can speak to that at all. Well, I guess I'd, I'd turn that back to you and ask, what are we supposed to do about that? I mean, is there some alternative? You're persuading people to be more rational or no, redistribute uh, wealth or something? I think it's policy. Um, policy can dictate um, the consumer behavior to a certain extent if it's implemented in the right way. Um, I think also that localizing economies, so we have these big food conglomerates that with factory farming and um, uh, so that's already externalities there, but it's cheap ostensibly to us, it's cheap at the register but the energy that it takes to truck these things is really bad and not sustainable in the long term. So if we're eating locally, which is unaffordable right now because of policies that subsidize uh, soy and grain and, and other, and corn. So there are things we can do with policy to change the nature of our globalized world. They're maybe deemed as radical right now, but it's how can you get this thinking into the mainstream because we want to create a sustainable world for future generations. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, so I guess I would challenge you back and say, well, food is really cheap here because it's, you know, it's being transported and transportation is really cheap. Let's make that transportation more expensive is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. You know, so what if that driving the p tomato from California to Minnesota really was that you, they bore the full cost of that the carbon, I don't know what the degree of the carbon tax would have to be, but it would make it more expensive, right? right. And that would have ripple effects on all kinds of things. I agree. People, you know, the, the whole, the, the explicit rational model of consumer behavior, there have been economists who say, actually, people aren't particularly, there's a the whole idea of behavioral economics. So if that, that econ 101 or 1101 or whatever you take, yeah, there's, you know, people are a little bit, you know, more complex than that. Um, but I guess I would say, 
you know, if what we want is a 1.5 degree or a 1 degree or a 0 degree, <laughs> in any case, and, you know, there are all sorts of, you know, lots of studies about what will get us there, but uh, certainly making those fossil fuels more expensive to burn is, 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 is going to be the ticket to do, to accomplish that, I would say. Sure. Thanks. We got I, some other questions. We got time for maybe one or two more. Go ahead. I'm, I'm so yep. aware, as I often am in these conversations, about how difficult it is to create the bridge from a faith orientation to life to an economic orientation to life. Because as I listen to this conversation, what goes on in my head as a Lutheran is, we are always at the same time saint and sinner. We are reflective of the beauty and the wonder and the image of God and we live life turned in on self. And that we are so anthropocentric in our turned in on self so that I want to make decisions ultimately that will be self-serving, my needs, be they rational or just emotional or physical. And I don't naturally orient my life to what will serve the neighbor, the creation, until I have literally died to that self. And we as Lutherans say that doesn't happen as an act of will that literally is a gift of God's grace in Christ, that you are free from that preoccupation with self and being self-serving. And in that freedom, your orientation becomes what will serve the common good, what will serve the creation as your orienting question to life. And that literally takes a radical conversion that we can't do by an act of will or manipulation or economic theory. It literally is a faith transformation. <coughs> So for me, the conversation about economics happens in the realm of that freedom I've been given vis-a-vis -vis faith to live and serve the neighbor, the common good, the all of creation. And I'm not going to get to those places through a better economic theory or public policy, but they will inform economic theory and public policy. But looking at your eyes, that probably didn't help create the bridge, but I want <laughs> But I, I have a quote here that I've been dying to sneak in here that uh, uh, stirs things, stir things up a little bit from uh, one of uh, Professor Holman's colleagues over at the University of Minnesota at a conference recently who said, uh, he said it, I didn't say this, he said, preaching, moralizing, and hoping to change lifestyles by rhetoric alone, we've tried that zillions of times. The depressing statement about people is when it finally comes down to making decisions pocketbook decisions, prices, 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 that's at the end of the day what people seem to respond to. That is a pretty strong econ economist, I suspect, who says that. And it was not Professor Holman's, but uh, any, any comments, uh, Bishop? Well, I'll be snarky. <laughs> I don't know what economist has written a book recently that has created as much engagement as the papal encyclical. I agree. 10,000 10, people didn't go to Salt Lake City from all over the world because an economic theory was being rolled out or an assembly of economists. It was people of deeply held generations, millennia long religious convictions said, we can't live this way together in our common earth and our common humanity, but we don't need to sacrifice our truth claims in order to create that more just society and more sustainable creation. And so that economist is an economist. I'm a okay. priest, so obviously <laughs> we're going to keep Let, let me tell one, one quote out on the other side for a minute here where I go that uh, Professor, Professor Holmans can respond to perhaps. The strategy of buying and selling carbon credits, this is from the encyclical now, can lead to a new form of speculation which would not help reduce the emission of polluting gases worldwide. It may simply become a ploy which permits maintaining the excessive consumption of some countries and sectors. Yeah. Professor Holmans? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I guess I would respond to the previous thing and say, I think the encyclical was, uh, Professor Krippenau was talking about the upcoming Paris talks, right, in December. To, and I think it seems like the encyclical was timed in order to give a lot of juice and a lot of energy and a lot of uh, uh, thrust towards 
this international conference a place where nations are going to come together and try to figure out how to contend with this global problem. So I think it recognizes the, the religious, the, the convictions of, of, of Catholics, but I think it also comes into the world to say, we need our leaders and our politicians and our economists to really help us out and come together and, and establish some, some institutions and some ways to, to move forward some targets so that uh, we have, you know, 2% would be awesome, less than 2% would be great. I mean, the, the catastrophe that could happen with a 8%, 10% is just not something we want to think about. We want to, by all means, avoid that. The, th the one thing that I did not talk about was there's a study by CITI, you know, C-I-T-I, that talks about the cost of doing nothing versus the cost of actually doing something about this, ignoring the externalities. But the cost of inaction are higher than the cost of action. So uh, it's sort of one of those things where we have to, right? I mean, it makes economic sense, plus you get, you know, the lack of, you know, <laughs> apocalypse. You know, it's something we've got to do, but we have to figure out a way to come together and make this make this happen. And I'm hoping that economics and a price on carbon might be part of what, what's in the mix in Paris. I would imagine that it will be. Thank you both. Uh, Professor Bish? Well, uh, Professor. I, I think this is a Bish great Bish. example for us Lutherans of Luther's understanding of two realms of how God governs. God governs the kingdom of the right and the kingdom of the left. The kingdom of the left through reason for the sake of order and the sustaining of life. Kingdom of the... Did I get that right? No. The kingdom of the right, the kingdom of the left, anyway. Uh, through the gospel for the sake of faith. And so, as Lutherans, we believe God gives us reason to struggle with economics and to struggle with these issues and to come with responsible ethics. But we also say the lens through which we look at what makes that responsible is the impact on the neighbor. And the neighbor in this case includes all of creation, not just on self. So go back and read and see Professor Stortz on the way out. She'll give you a primer on Lutheran theology. <laughs> Very good. Uh, the, uh, we, we've got time for one more, one more comment, and I'm going to call on uh, Congressman Sable uh, here for that comment or question or whatever um, Congressman Sable may have. <laughs> You're on. Oh, you have one over here, Tom, in the corner. He's oh, all right. If you go, we can wait. I'm a, I was told that we've got to get this done by 8.30, so we'll keep it. Uh, Professor Boyd. Well, I appreciate the panel, but um, the papal encyclical, as well as his tour through Latin America and his work as Bogotio is in the Buenos Aires bishopry, reminds me of Martin Luther King's uh, comment that is not part of the language explicitly of the encyclical, but that um, we need a return to the deepest wellsprings of democracy. Return to the deepest wellsprings of democracy. Uh, I, I was shaped by the, by the movement, and I heard King and Vincent Harding and everyone talk about democracy not as a, elections, that's simply a small moment, but as a way of life. And it strikes me that throughout Francis or Bergoglio's career, there is a deep democracy theme, especially after becoming Bishop of Buenos Aires. So the way he democratized the decision-making in the church, <laughs> the way he uh, developed hundreds of, of slum priests who organized among poor communities. I think Greg's exactly right in the terms of the technocracy. He's the, you can look at the encyclical as a very trenchant critique of outside expert control, which he basically says has come to characterize the professional systems around the world. The substitution of relational cultures for informational cultures where people seek to have external control. But then finally, here, here Mark, I want to challenge you on the co-creation. The, the encyclical is full of the social uh, tradition of Catholic thinking about work. And the value of work is precisely co-creative. It's created co-creator. It's not equivalent with the divinity. But. And in Latin America, he said a very important thing that was very similar to Eleanor Ostrom's deep point about the commons, which was, we'll lose the commons unless we participate in governance of the commons. 
and also creation and sustenance of the commons. So it was both the act of labor as well as the patterns of governance. But uh, he has a wonderful phrase uh, in his trip to Latin America where, where he says, in, in biblical narratives, uh, cultivation comes after care and before care. So unless we cultivate, we don't care. And unless we care, we don't cultivate, but those are inseparable. So he's really calling for a return to what John Paul called the subjective understandings of labor, which is that as we feel like we're involved in, in sustaining and creating and co-creating the world, we develop a care for the world. Now that is a, that is a radical democratic perspective that I think we need to lift up. Thank you. That's very helpful. I, I'm, I won't take co-creator off the table. I'm just saying co-creature co -creature can be a kind of balancing of the destructive tendencies that come when we only think of ourselves as co creators But thank you. That was very helpful for many reasons. All right. Well, uh, thank you. Um, uh, I think we will, uh, Congressman Sabo just said, it's been covered, <laughs> for, uh, for which we all uh, say thank you. Uh, and I say uh, thank you all for coming this evening. It's been a very interesting discussion, uh, uh, and the uh, playoff, the, the two in juxtaposition, the economics and the, some of the religious background and the ecumenical nature of uh, many of things, what the Pope has done. And I urge you to take a look at that encyclical. It is very readable. And uh, it, it does make you uncomfortable. And it maybe does um, transform all of us a little bit as we get into it and think about these serious issues. And he does have a section on implementation there that gets back into the, some of the economics and how do we do all of this. And for those of you who are students here at Augsburg in particular, <clears throat> I would urge you to pay, I hope, a lot of attention to this conference in December in Paris. <clears throat> that um, President Pribino mentioned uh, an opening statement uh, that's coming up. It is the world leaders. I always thought it was a huge thing when um, President Obama and the Chinese uh, cut a deal about this. India has now joined in. And there is, I, I think, a real potential for something. And this morning's paper had a story that all of the cardinals and bishops over in the Vatican signed a document together calling for a legally binding agreements coming out of this Paris conference to deal with the problem of global warming, which, as one commentator said when President Obama talked about it a while ago, said his comments were verging on the apocalyptic. This show how serious he takes the issue. So students in particular, there's a lot of NGOs, there's a lot of students around going to be over there. I think there's some great opportunities to help make our common home a little better place. Thank you all for coming very much. Thank you.